Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates of Pancakes. We're sitting down today with John Grundy. Coach Grundy is the University of Missouri Assistant Director of Athletic Performance. He works directly with baseball, cheer, and sprinters. He joins Missouri staff after working the past two years as Assistant Strength and Conditioning Coach at the University of Memphis. At Memphis, Grundy designed and implemented strength and conditioning programs for baseball, women's tennis, men's soccer, rifle, and sprinters. Prior to working at Memphis, Grundy was the head strength and conditioning coach at Marymount University and was a graduate assistant at George Washington University. Grundy has a BA in sport and exercise studies from Randolph College and a MS in exercise science and strength and conditioning from George Washington University. Grundy has a CSCS, is functional range conditioning certified, is precision nutrition level one certified, and is USA weightlifting level one certified. Welcome to the show, coach. Appreciate you having me on. So are you getting settled in now that you've, you've made the move? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's kind of getting settled in. The box is getting less and less. My wife and kids up here uh, just recently. So uh, we're starting to get a little settled in and um, starting to get settled in at work and getting a little bit of routine. Um, so excited to get the athletes, um, all of our athletes back on campus later this month. So moving into the position you've moved into as director of athletic performance, coming from Memphis to Missouri, how much work is there figuring out what was done prior to you implementing your stuff and then trying to get on page with the team? Um, it's been a pretty easy transition. Um, kind of in my role as assistant director, uh, I have three different teams, um, with baseball. It's been a pretty easy transition in terms of, um, what I want to do with the guys in summer two matched up well with what was being done, um, in June. Uh, they had a, for some great programming by the previous strength coach. Um, so it, it kind of all worked out where it was an easy transition for the returners. Um, we had most of our freshmen uh, on campus taking summer two classes. Um, so we got them implemented pretty quickly as well. So it was a pretty easy transition, kind of my time in. It was right in between uh, voluntary blocks for returners, uh, got a lot of returners on the program. So it, it's been – Timing wise, maybe a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I kind of like one one quick D load block before they come back to campus. It's turned into kind of a two week ramp up, but outside of that, it's been a pretty easy transition from a programming standpoint. Um, and then I was lucky. Uh, my coworkers did a great job of of setting up cheer and the sprinters through the summer. Um, so I'll be able to kind of pick up with them once they get back to campus at the end of the month um, and have a very smooth transition going into the next year. Now, that would have been my question uh, of all the teams that you're running now. Is cheer probably the first one to get going in less than a month? Um, right now, uh, yeah. It, we'll, we'll begin them all going very soon. Um, they'll all kind of get going in less than a month uh, because when cheer gets back into the weight room, it's a little bit later than necessarily just picking up in the fall. Uh, so they'll pick up when school uh, picks up at the end of the month, the week of the 21st. Um, so I'll actually have all three groups picking up around that time. Now, this is something that I just got to hit on last week in a podcast, and it's pretty interesting to me. I, I don't know how much it pertains to coaches out there, but I think we're seeing more cheerleaders in the weight room. So with what I know about cheers, you have throwers and you have flyers. So your throwers are really strong, big backs, big legs, and very explosive creating that in the division one thrower are you uh sticking with the olympic lifts or are you throwing some bodybuilding in to build backs what are you doing to create that uh athlete yeah um i would say it's very similar um to how i train other athletes as well uh at first we're going to build work capacity um maybe a little bit of bodybuilding type hypertrophy work. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it bodybuilding. I'd call it more hypertrophy work if needed um, early off season. Um, but mostly just focusing on building general strength, general work capacity, um, and really trying to make sure that we get them into strong movement patterns. Um, so if they're you know going to spend a lot of time overhead, which they do, um, making sure that we have them strong overhead and we're not going to end up having lower back injuries due to not having the range of motion to be able to get stacked with their torso. Um, so I'm very movement first. Uh, we'll build strength off of that movement. Um, so you'll see some correctives built in to try to keep them healthy that way. Um, 
But overall, we build strength very similarly, really focusing on the foundational patterns, first building with a work capacity block and then a general strength block, working into a max strength block to pen on timing um, and kind of just building it from there. Now, your flyer, on the other hand, is totally opposite. Now, is that more of a mobility athlete that you're working with? Uh, where do you go with them? Um, I'll be honest. It, it's still very much very similar um, with my with my foundational movements um, in terms of we won't necessarily have to put the same kind of size on them or, or having the overhead strength or anything like that. Um, but they'll still need those foundational strength movements. Um, so my programming really based on the athlete, I don't deviate from those foundational movements. Um, so the programming block to block will look a little bit different um, in terms of rep schemes and, and percentages and, and things like that, um, specifically based on the time of the year and kind of what we need to do for that particular athlete. Um, but the foundational movements all stay, stay the same. We're always going to squat. We're always going to hinge. Uh, we're always going to do upper body push, upper body pull, uh, core, single leg stability. Um, so what particular movements I choose um, really goes back to conversations with me and the coach um, and what they've seen successful with in the past. Um, but overall, we're going to see those same foundational movements in every program. Now this one, you know, I'm not around it at all, but ten, but tennis, working with tennis players, you've got immense acceleration phases with quick changes directions. How much sprint work, acceleration work, change of direction work is involved with the tennis player, or is that sport specific and picked up on the court? No, uh, we we would usually try to get on the court um, and do sprint, acceleration, or change of direction work at least twice a week. Uh, sometimes we're more successful than others. They're probably the craziest schedule to work on around in their off season because um, they have about a four six week period where they're doing a lot of tournaments. Um, and it's like, you'll have like half the team one week and then a different half the next week. Um, so consistency and training gets a little bit tougher in the fall. You get about a month, um, before they start their fall tournaments. Um, once they finish their fall tournaments, you get about two weeks and then you're sending them home for Thanksgiving and then basically home for winter break. Um, so the tennis schedule is a little tough to work around. Uh, we try to do as much on court training as we could. Um, when it comes to acceleration work, um, I'm a short to long approach. Uh, so I'm going to start with some short acceleration, specifically with tennis, um, trying to work from different positioning, uh, that gets us lower. So maybe push up starts to begin with going into fall and starts later on, um, more plan to reactionary with the change of direction. So we'll put different cones out for different drills and eventually make it more reactionary and then eventually agility based as well. Um, so that's kind of how we do our programming, but trying to get at least twice a week on the courts with them is pretty vital. Um, just kind of getting them moving in different patterns. They do a lot of obviously side to side, but trying to get them forward and back and, and all that. So their bodies are prepared for it. Uh, and then kind of just working on them being as efficient on the court as possible. I know you a little bit more as a baseball guy. That seems to be where maybe your passion lies. How did you end up in the baseball realm? Were you a baseball player or is this something that worked out for you and you enjoyed it? Yeah, um, it's something that worked out for me and I enjoyed it. Um, I was not a baseball player. I was a cross player growing up. Um, I actually did not play baseball because I didn't enjoy playing it. Uh, it's uh, As a player, I enjoyed the faster paced games uh, that may be involved um, a little less of the analytical side and more reactionary side right off the bat. Um, and lacrosse was kind of my passion. Uh, but as I got into strength conditioning, baseball was a challenge that was thrown on me pretty quickly. Uh, I helped a lot with them when I was doing internships um, at Newman University in, in Wichita, Kansas. And then when I became a GA, it was one of the teams that was given to me. And, and I love the challenge. I mean, right off the bat, um, as a young GA, I was having a program for two completely different um, parts of a team in the pitchers and, and hitters. Um, and really what their movements are and then working around a pitcher schedule and working around a baseball schedule is pretty challenging. Uh, and then it, it, it caused me to do a lot more research and, uh, and dive really into uh, biomechanics and anatomy, and especially with pitching. It's not necessarily a natural, natural movement for the human body. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, and it it kind of opened up some avenues. I had some success um, at GW and then we went to a regional when I was at Marymount University and 
at Memphis, had, had success that's now springboarded me here to Missouri. So um, it's one of those I've always enjoyed working with multiple sports, uh, not just one sport, but baseball has been one that um, I've been kind of intertwined with everywhere I've been. Um, and I've learned a lot and developed in that realm. Now, we talked about this the other day, but you travel with the team. Mm -hmm. So you're gone quite a bit. And it came up that, uh, you know, you're, tra you're traveling, you're on the road, your guys still have to work out. Is it common to use other schools' facilities, or do you guys have to find a place to get your guys in and get them worked? Yeah, I mean, the awesome thing about the baseball world is usually we can work it around the other schools and be able to use their facilities. Um, when I was in the AAC, I don't think there was a single school that we couldn't use their facilities. Um, even on the road in non-conference play, we were able to always get access to facilities. Um, a few times, like, you're going to be in a situation where it doesn't, logistically makes sense like for an example when we were at uh, george washington it was tough for road teams to use our facility uh, because our home field was in arlington virginia which is about a 20 minute drive from boggy bottoms campus um and there's other kind of inner city schools that are a little bit um uh, in a similar boat where maybe campus is a little far away from the field and and where they would work out so maybe not all levels um you have that ability um Luckily, where we are, if we don't have that ability, we're going to find another facility to train. Um, our goal is always going to be to make sure that we're getting three workouts in with our guys um, and kind of work from there. So uh, we, we've we had success within the past. Sometimes you got to get creative. Usually we don't have to rely on hotel workouts, um, but at different levels you do. I mean, when I was at GW, I think we relied on hotel workouts a lot more because um, a lot of schools we traveled to it was more difficult to try to find time. Um, and I did not travel with the team back then. Um, so, you know, writing hotel workouts and trying to get guys working on the road was a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but, you know, the more consistent you can stay with their training, the more gains you can make through such a long season. Now with, you know, the SEC, it's it's pretty good sized travel, but not like uh, what the Big 12 is going to be now. So with that, you got a day flying in or driving in or whatever it is you do. How do you utilize uh, game day workouts to make up for some of what you spend traveling? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we tend to do game day workouts even at home. Uh, we're going to make sure that we get get our guys in. So when we're at home, it, it's going to be a quick potentiation type workout. Um, if we have a strength movement, it's going to be more on the speed strength spectrum, maybe touching strength speed, uh, depending on where we are at the year. Uh, but we're going to get some plyometric movements. Uh, we're going to work on a little bit of mobility, really just getting the guys quick in and out, 30-minute potentiation type workout um, where we get to touch on things that maybe we don't get to touch on throughout the year. Um, we also utilize space on the road, particularly on the weekends, to get a little bit extra mobility in, um, getting the guys moving. That's really what I think is probably even more vital, um, especially after a long day's travel, kind of getting their bodies reset, uh, we got some taller guys that have to get crammed into smaller spaces. Um, I expect the the travel might be a little bit different here in the SEC, but like when we would take bus trips for for Memphis, you know, we we take travel close to 30, 40 people, um, and so some of our guys had to double up. Some of these guys are are six foot tall, doubling up on a on a bus. They, they're going to be a little tight, and we're going to have to kind of get their bodies moving and get their bodies reset um, to make sure that they can recover well. Uh, so we use different things like PRI uh, type of concepts. We use FRC. We use um, various different concepts like l stretching just to kind of get those guys reset, make them feel better, uh, make their bodies feel better because it's the wear and tear. I mean, they're always going to feel good in, in February, still feel pretty good in March. We start conference play uh, about mid-March in the SEC. So we got to make sure these guys are feeling good in the April and, and then May uh, and then June. Hopefully we're, we're competing in a regional and super regional. And when you get to that point, you're really on the road the whole time, unless you're lucky enough to host those. Um, so we have to really build a pretty good routine about what we're going to do on game days um, versus, you know, Saturdays and Sundays and, and kind of what that looks like. So usually on Fridays, we try to get some kind of potentiation type workout on Saturday. We're going to try to get some kind of mobility type workout. Um, and we might do the same thing on Thursday. Thursday night after practice, um, just a quick 10, 15-minute um, mobility routine at the field just to kind of get the guys feeling loose 
um, before they head to bed. That way, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they're not feeling stiff. Um, the other big thing is hydration. Uh, we emphasize hydration on the road. If we're taking a bus trip, I'm handing out water. Uh, you know, just make sure the guys are staying hydrated. And it's almost like a little ticket. Uh, when we get up, when we stop for lunch, they're going to hand me two empty water bottles and I give two more when we get back on the bus. Um, and it's, it's one of those that, that worked well at Memphis. Just the guys appreciated it. Me constantly handing them water and make sure they stayed hydrated because sometimes with that travel, that's the first thing they think they, they forget, they fall asleep and most of their day's gone and, uh, or, or they zone out or they're working on homework and, you know, maybe that's maybe not the first thing on their mind. Um, but, you know, again, dehydrated and, and, and not eating correctly is sometimes the hardest things of that, that Thursday travel. I could see that, especially if you're going to be on the bus quite a while and it's a big event to stop and get everybody off, get everybody fed, you know, where maybe just getting them there is the better idea, but you're trying to balance that out. Absolutely. Now, I had seen this, and I talked to other coaches about it, and I've never really delved into it far enough now, but I'm starting to look into it more. Using metrics to determine player readiness, I saw that you use uh, a vertical jump. How often will you be checking their vertical jumps to kind of see where they're at through the course of the season? Yeah, we checked um, every two weeks when we when I was at Memphis. Um, part of that was the fact we only had one just jump at. Um, so we, we would utilize that. Um, uh, and when you're trying to take a, a bigger group through it, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Um, so we would check every two weeks. Um, ideally I'm using some kind of, you know, fatigue KPI, um, every week. Um, this one thing we're going to start this year is more, um, testing grip strength as well, specifically on our pitchers. I think it's important for our hitters as well. Um, uh, but with a pitcher, if, if grip strength is going pretty quickly, we're opening ourselves up to elbow and shoulder injuries. Um, so those are, those are ones that I've used in the past and plan on using. Um, we also have force plates here at Mizzou that we plan on using, um, how frequently we're still kind of determining as a staff. Uh, but I would say in season, we're going to be pretty, pretty frequent, um, uh, whether we're making a ton of adjustments year one, um, probably not. I think a lot of data collection, uh, you utilizing that would be important if we're seeing like a major issue, we're going to make an adjustment, but kind of getting a good read for how we respond throughout the course of a year, um, how we respond, you know, travel versus home weekends and, and things like that are really important. And, you know, we, we do have access to some heart rate monitoring as well that we'll use probably more in preseason and fall ball um, than we will in season uh, because I think that will give us a good idea for the low demands to expect um, in practices. I think that's what I've found um, – with coaching staffs is kind of learning what the the bigger demand is. And usually practice is a little bit bigger of a demand in baseball um, than a, than a game. I mean, obviously it's tough to play Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that's a, that's a physical demand in itself. Um, but practices in, when you take a count, like a three, four hour practice, it's a little bit more intense than a three, four hour game um, from just a workload perspective and kind of the pace and what we're trying to accomplish and those types of things. You're just going to get more reps in practice, um, so the demand's going to be a little bit higher. So baseball is one of those sports that I tend to think that we're preparing them for practice uh, versus the games, um, and that will prepare them for the games um, because they'll be able to stay healthy throughout the preseason and then should be prepared for the demands of the games as well. Now, kind of going back in there on the grip strength and the vertical jump, how much deviation are you looking at before you decide, hey, the workload's getting to be too much, let's back off of them a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the grip strength, we're still kind of determining what our parameter is going to look like. It's it's something that we want to implement this year, um, but I wouldn't feel comfortable necessarily putting deviation on there quite yet because uh, we're still playing around with with even how we're going to test it. Uh, but with the vertical jumps, I start looking at, you know, for a deviation that concerns me, we're talking 3 to 5%. More than 5% is where I start getting really good, and that's t- I'm talking about a decrease in vertical jump. Um it becomes a little more concerning in season versus fall ball because we had the whole fall to kind of work out form and things like that. Um, when I get to Mizzou, I'm going to go hands on hips when I do my vertical jumps. Um, so when we do that, that's something that athletes have to learn. So there's going to be some deviation probably the first month, month or so, just from them learning, getting more used to it. You're going to see a lot of probably more increases 
um, kind of getting used to using their lower body a little bit better if they re re utilize their arms. Um, but that really focuses on that lower body power compared to being able to use their arms. Or not. Some people are really good at using their arms and that increases their vert a lot, uh, but it kind of isolates that lower body and just from a fatigue management system. Um, but yeah, I usually look at uh, a 5% deck or decrease is when I get really concerned. 3% is when I start like kind of keeping an eye. Uh, if we get to 10%, that's where it's, you know, something's absolutely got to change. Um, so that five to 10 is like, okay, yeah, we're at risk of serious injury now. Uh, 5% is something, okay, let's look at our program and how can we make adjustments. Uh, and that 3% is, is considered pretty common. Um, so I'm not too concerned, but that's maybe where I would put them in the yellow just to keep an eye on. Now we'll go back to what you had said about conditioning the players for practice. I just had a couple kids from the gym. They went over to Missouri camp for baseball. They really enjoyed it. But from what they said, Coach Jackson really likes to keep the pace up. He's really got guys moving, engaged, doesn't give them a lot of time to kind of wander off, maybe mentally. Mm -hmm. So are you at practice watching kind of what's going on so that you know where you need to be in the weight room? Absolutely. So we accomplish this uh, two different ways. I do go to every practice, uh, or I will here at the University of Missouri. Uh, Memphis was a little bit more difficult, specifically last year. Uh, in the fall, we did not have our home field was being renovated. So we were practicing all around the Memphis area. So sometimes we would practice 40 minutes away and with other team responsibilities, that wasn't necessarily feasible for me to make it out there. Um, but this year, I will be at every practice. I've seen enough of Coach Jackson's practices that if he just tells me what drills he's running, I have a pretty good idea of what kind of intensity the practice would be. Um, but we also, we, we meet as a staff very regularly. Uh, we'll meet as a strength staff, sports medicine, um, uh, academics, and coaching staff at least once a week. I try to be in more meetings than I, er, than just that once a week. Um, I plan on being in as many meetings as I can um, to see what we're doing that day. Uh, but in those weekly meetings, we kind of cover what we're going to try to accomplish throughout the week and what days we're going to try to accomplish it. Um, it's usually get a report from academics and sports medicine. So we kind of understand where they're coming from as well in terms of how injuries are rehabbing. Um, but from an academic standpoint, who's got midterms coming up, who's got finals coming up, um, who's maybe struggling in the classroom or who, who, who maybe hasn't increased workload this semester compared to last semester. Um, you know, concerns that they're seeing on the academic side. So we have conversations uh is is are there are there habits that we can work on to help them with that so it doesn't bleed into the athletic side as well um kind of it, it just helps us keep us all on the same page um but being at practice having a good feel for he does run a very up-tempo practice uh i love it um as as a strength or athletic performance coach it keeps me busy too uh you know the the thing is is just making sure that we prepare the specifically the the position players preparing them for the workloads of practice um, is important because we know we're going to do some sort of base running every day. So we're going to get together and try to put that into as best of a high low system as we can. Um, but I got to make sure I spend the first four weeks that they're prepared for that because on day one, um, they might start feeling it. And by day five, we're risking injury if I didn't do my job. To prepare them. So um, I'm lucky I get four days a week with them, um, the four weeks leading up to team practice. Uh, so that's going to be a huge emphasis for us. It's just preparing them to be able to to handle that type of sprint volume and, and all of that once we get the team practice. Now, moving over to Missouri from Memphis, I'm sure you walked into a whole different category of how things go. Missouri, since they've joined the SEC, has just been on a steady incline of improving facilities, improving staff, everything that goes along with playing in a Power 5 conference. So I'm sure the staff is probably a new part for you, working with so many people. How do you manage utilizing a staff and not overstepping bounds and, and keeping a good balance of what's going on with your team? Absolutely. Are you are you specifically talking about baseball staff or athletic performance staff? Athletic performance staff. Okay. Um, so with athletic performance staff, I walk into a really good situation at Missouri. Um, it's very welcoming to, to coaches to help out with other teams, which I think is important because it allows us to kind of build relationships and, and, kind of learn how each other coach and kind of pick up new things. And I have a lot more availability to be able to do that as well um, in terms of being able to pop over uh, or pop out of my office and, and, and help with a softball lift or help with a gymnastics lift or 
um, help with another track and field group that I don't currently work with because it's going to allow me to pick up new things um, without overstep. And it's very welcoming. It was something that was already kind of in place before I got there in terms of just other coaches being on the floor. It's not weird for the student athletes. Um, other places I've been, I wouldn't say that's how it was at Memphis either. I think we were very welcoming. Um, but I've been other places where maybe it was a, a little weird and they're like, hey, why why, why is that coach here today? Or who's that? Or It's just kind of normal. Um, I'm the new guy and I've helped out with a, a few groups or been on the floor with a few groups and, and athletes aren't weirded out by it. They just come up and introduce themselves or I introduce myself. And, um, it's, it's pretty normal for them, which is pretty awesome. Um, uh, plus getting here over the summer has allowed me kind of get a little bit more comfortable. Um, so it's when, when things really get crazy and, and our weight room really gets full, um, I'll feel comfortable walking up with other coaches and helping out and, and, and building those relationships. And that will allow me to learn. I think that's the first thing is, the more we know each other, the more we have a relationship, the more we'll be willing to share with each other. Um, sometimes when coaches get a little bit overprotective of what they're doing, um, I don't want to say it's a sense of insecurity, but it is a little bit um, where it's like, are they judging me? Are they trying to catch me in the mess up or things like that? Um, where I think here at Missouri, we're just very much an open book. We want to learn from each other. Um, I got a bunch of staff members that have a lot of experience that I can learn from. Um, in terms of different levels of Division One, but also in terms of different sports and, and different movement systems and different, um, you know, Olympic lifting backgrounds versus um, powerlifting backgrounds versus strongman backgrounds. And I think that's what really makes us great coaches is kind of taking bits and pieces from what other people are teaching us and building it into our own philosophy. Like I said, I'm very big on the movement systems um, and very big on uh, making sure my athletes move to the best of their ability. Like if my mentor um, or any of my mentors walked in, I'd want them to be like, yep, that's John's training. He demands full range motion in the off season and, and his athletes are moving really well. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, but I also realize I have bigger resources around me where maybe when I'm trying to take my program into a whole new level, cause I have more time to be able to dive, you know, dive deeper into individualizing programming or, or cutting in smaller groups. I got resources around me. What's the best way to do that? What's the most efficient way to do that? Um, Cause I think sometimes when we start breaking our programming off and we don't really have a way to do that. And we're kind of just using our athletes as guinea pigs. We go down rabbit holes and we get about, you know, two training cycles in and we're like, wow, I did not need to do that. And I'm not getting the results. I thought of. Uh, because that's the tough thing about college athletics is off seasons are only about 13, 14 weeks tops. Uh, and then you have about a four week preseason and then you have a season. Um, and, and usually it's followed that off season to preseason followed by a long gap, you know, the fall sports that could be, you know, a one to two month gap, um, uh, in the winter sports, you know, you're talking about a month gap, uh, you know, six, four to six weeks, depending on kind of how your, your semester plays out. So it gets tough, uh, when you're constantly having to take those gaps and you want to make sure you're peaking at the right time and, and all that. So, um, we kind of just, you know, the more I can learn, the more I can maximize my time with them, I think the better we can be. You kind of touched on something there. I was talking to a coach the other day, really good coach. And even as good as he is, he said he struggles with imposter syndrome. So at the college level, do you run into that with some coaches? Like, you know, they got there, but they're still not sure of the talent they have that actually brought them to that level. Yeah, yeah, I think – that's all of us, right? Um, I think there's always a little bit that that we have some some talent and the reason that we get to the positions that we're in um, and somebody unlocks us, right? Somebody kind of helps us take it to a whole new level. Um, like me, like I, like I said, I, I'm very interested in the movement systems. Um, specifically, even diving a lot in the PRI and FRC. And, um, our senior, senior director of athletic performance, Brad, um, I will be honest with you. I'm nowhere close to being as smart as him. I'm excited to work with him because I think he's going to help me and kind of unlock my knowledge. Like I can, I have a basic knowledge, but he can take it to a whole new level. I mean, that man knows more about the foot and ankle than anybody else I've had a chance to work with, um, which is going to be awesome working with him and kind of picking his brain and, and how I can take my program into a different level. Um, and I think that we all, if we get to the point where we're not getting challenged that way, we probably put ourselves in a position where we're going to stop working. Um, there, and, and whether that is, it's somebody you work with, cause some of us, like when I was at Marymount, I was one man show. I needed to sit, grow from people that I didn't see on a daily basis, whether it was making phone calls, 
or it was doing uh, courses like, uh, you know, self-education courses, continuing education courses. It, we have to find a way to grow and kind of unlock that. Uh, you know, same thing in the private sector. If you, if you run your own facility, you can't just get comfortable with the status quo um, because I think what happens there is it gets outdated really fast. We're a very young profession uh, where we're constantly changing. You know, the way you got to think about it. I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't train pitchers. I mean, pitchers did not touch the weight. Um, now we got pitchers that are that are training three to four days a week in season. Um, and, and it's programmed so they don't they, – that they're able to still make their starts and still not get fatigued and, and what that looks like and, and all that. But, I mean, it's a different type of athlete that's changing every day. And so our profession changes every day. So if we're still doing the same things we did five, six, even like two or three years ago, um, we're probably not doing ourselves a favor. Um, so uh, you know, I'm excited to work with the staff that I, I get to work with here at Missouri because um, I think they're really going to challenge me, um, even though the staff I had at Memphis did the same thing. Um, our director of athletic performance there, Nick Higgins, taught me a ton, and, and I continue to learn from Nick every day. Um, but now I get some more people in my corner that are just going to make it better. Now this is kind of in the weeds a little bit, and I'll ask it and we'll just see how you answer it. But you're talking about pitchers working out, you know, baseball players, they didn't want them to have that size. Do you think the steroid era in the MLB changed the perception of the way we look at strength and conditioning for baseball players? I can narrow that down a little bit. You know, they never wanted hitters to get too bulky. They didn't want pitchers to get too bulky. Roger Clemens pitching better as he retired than he was in his youth. Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds, you know, those guys were just massive and just cranking the ball out of the park. Well, for years, we held on to this belief that if they had too much size, they wouldn't be able to perform. And I guess that's kind of where I'm heading with the question, not to paint you in a corner or something like that. I understand your position as a uh, college strength coach. Uh, <laughs> you know, you don't want to recommend steroids, but just the yep. way we uh, the way we view a big, strong baseball player now. Yeah, um, I would say it's really coach's preference, um, and and I would I would just even use the MLB right like. It depends on the frame. Like Aaron Judge is a big human, and Aaron Judge hits a lot of home runs. Um, yeah, I'm a Phillies fan, and and I I you know, I, I'm, I hope he's going to have a better second half than he did the first half. But Trey Turner, he's one of the best baseball players too. They're very different from a physicality standpoint. Now, strong, hundred percent. I think you know the the idea of a baseball player being very strong is really important. Uh, the idea of bigger, yes. But are we talking about, in my my eyes, bulky? It really depends on the frame. And it depends on the position. You know, some some uh, coaches prefer maybe a more athletic, long, lanky pitcher uh, compared to somebody who maybe has a little bit more muscle. Um, and I would say maximizing their frame. So if we're trying to put mass on an individual and they're a little bit smaller in stature, they're going to be bulky. They're going to look bulky, at least. Um but, you know, if they, they're they they're six eight uh, with this crazy wingspan, to get them to throw hard, I don't need a really huge human. Now, we're going to continue to put muscle mass on. We want them um, just from a health standpoint. They got to have the muscle mass. They got to have the strength because um, they're going to try to create large velocities. And, you know, the idea of mass equals gas, it's not wrong. Uh, but in terms of, um, and I don't know if that's where, where, where you're going with it, but like a bulkier athlete, it really depends on their frame in my opinion, uh, because obviously if I have somebody who's 5'8", uh, they're going to be bulkier because I got to still put size, size on them. They still have to have some mass behind it because we're trying to propel an object. So we're trying to throw a baseball or hit a baseball. And the more mass we have, the easier that's going to be. That's just kind of um, goes back to physics. Um, so that's kind of where I stand with that. And it depends on how your coach recruits. If you have a pitching coach who likes the long, lengthy pitchers, uh, we're gonna put size on them. Don't get me wrong, but it's not. They're not gonna look nasty, right? You know, I got a, I got a, a sophomore pitcher here that that when you look at him, he you would have no idea that the kid's probably two twenty five, two thirty, but he he's a solid frame. He's still got some strength gains that I think we can still tap into, uh, but solid size kid. Uh, and I say kid, I should say player. Sorry, uh, but you know, it's one of those that I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, that's a that's a big boy. Right. Um, where, you know, if he was maybe a little bit, you know, uh, 
smaller in stature, he'd probably be a pretty thick uh, individual. So it, it's kind of, I would say, probably more important it's in the weight room than necessarily put in size on. Uh, but I do think there has been a change in the importance in the weight room. Um, and I think a big part of that, too, is just we're seeing a lot more injuries, right? Like UCLs, things like that. That is solely because we're throwing so hard. Um, and it, we're, we're creating ranges of motion that we've never really touched before and then volumes from specializing so young and, and all that. But our goal is to keep them healthy as long as we can so they can reach their professional dreams. And, and some of them get lucky and their elbows never go. That's awesome. Um, some of them, it goes as young as high school. Some of them, it, it happens in college. But um, the emphasis in the weight room is more around how are we putting mass where we need it to to protect the structures that we want to um, and then to be able to still be able to move uh, the way we want to so we can efficiently um, create the movement patterns. That we want. Now, looking back at some of your stuff that I've seen you post, you do a max effort pull up, which we do some here, but we don't probably do near enough. Adding that into your workout regimen, do you find that that's helping pitchers and hitters be uh, maybe less injury prone by developing that back just a little bit more? Yeah. And I, and I think it teaches them, you know, the reason that we do it is we have overhead athletes, right? Um, first, we make sure our athletes can get overhead seat. So that's kind of where our movement assessments come into play. That's where we build in some correctives. We won't lie. Not every one of our, our pitchers are going to start with uh, pull-ups. Some of them will never do them um, based on injury history or, uh, you know, doctor's recommendations and, and things like that. You know, sometimes when you have somebody who's had a labrum surgery, they're not going to have that range of motion um, to be able to safely go overhead uh, right off the bat and and maybe ever because it's just going to pinch kind of where they had the injury site. And so we, we work around that. So lat pull downs, um, developing the lat is still really important to us. Um, but the lat is so it's it's a huge part of the throwing motion, right? And if we don't have strong lats, um, we're not going to be able to reach the velocities that we want. To. Um, so in terms of keeping them healthy, yeah, I would much rather them be engaged in their lats when they're throwing than putting all the stress sheerly on their elbows or shoulders. Um, but also we talk about shoulder stabilization, right? And we talk about the joint by joint approach, um, whether you're a fan of it or not, it makes sense where we want the shoulder to be more mobile. So the scaps have to be more stable. Um, and the only way the scaps can be stable is if, you know, the serratus and everything surrounding it are, are strong and allow it to glide around the rib cage the way we want. Um, and I think chin-ups are a great example to be able to do it. Um, I won't lie, this will be the first weight room that I've been able to train baseball where I have access to cable machines um, to be able to do lap pulls. Um, up to this point, the lap pull downs have been specifically with bands. We've gotten creative. Um, or we do inverted rows to keep everything a little bit more horizontal for those guys we can't do. Uh, new script pull-ups is, is my preferred choice if we can't do them. Um, those are the, that, that's what we've had to rely on. But so I have been a bigger fan of a, a new script, um, chin up. And I think just like any other movement, it's a movement that we can max out. Right. Um, and, and by maxing out, I want to be completely honest. We very rarely work up to one rep maxes on anything. And, and chin ups is probably one that maybe I do, uh, you know, I actually do work up to a true one rep max because it, it, it happens a little quicker than some of the other ones in terms of form breakdown and, and those. And I care so much about just correct form and range of motion that, it, you know, being able to hit one heavy rep um, and kind of building percentages off of that uh, works a little better than some of the other movements. Uh, I will never do a one rep max on a squat. I'll never do it on a deadlift and I'll never do it on a bench press. Um, I do work up to heavy sets of three, five, um, depending on what our programming is, um, maybe a heavy double. Um, but, you know, in terms of a true one rep max, it's just not how I operate. Um, I more go off of estimated you know, training maxes uh, and kind of build from there. Or I use gym aware uh, or BBT or, or something like that to, to kind of build from that. But um, chin-ups has been huge for us. We've seen um, it's built some pretty stable shoulders um, and then and engage the lats. Um, but the lats are rotational movements. So being able to do some kind of rotational lat pull down, um, is important as well. Um, sorry, not rotational muscle, not movement. Um, so for us, it's, it's definitely part of it and I've seen some good success with it. Um, but at the same time, we spend time, something that maybe I haven't 
posted enough of. We spend a lot of time making sure we do them correct. Um, because if they're not engaging um and allowing the scaps the way they're supposed to, they're gonna put a lot of stress in their elbows. And that's why it's it's kind of a scary thing um uh, for pitchers and maybe it's not the most comfortable thing. Um so we just kind of build from there and then different times of the year I take it out. Uh as we get deep into the season, we very rarely um do a ton of chin ups. And if we do chin ups, it's an option, right? If some guys love doing them, they feel better doing them, we're hitting chin ups. Um uh, other guys they're hitting some kind of like lap pull down or or horizontal row. And, um, a little bit more autonomy when we get to those those uh, those maze as we're kind of peaking for the, the conference tournament. Um, but it, you get a good feel for the guys that that feel like you get a huge benefit from it, um, and other guys that feel like all right, it's a little bit more achy and, and you know some of those old injuries or or wear and tear is starting to pop. I know that seems like a crazy out of the blue question, but you know as I watch athletes come in and out, it seems like the two things they struggle with when they first get in are dips and pull ups. So trying to reinforce injury prevention, assuming they have a limited background of injuries, using that pull-up and getting them where they need to be could actually help quite a bit. And it just, I think maybe it gets overlooked in its simplicity. Absolutely. And I, I think pull-ups and chin-ups and neutral grip chin-ups, like there's there's so many different ways you can grip it um, that, that you're able to still get what you want out of it. Um, based on the athlete's limitations, I think neutral grip is kind of like the most natural, uh, which is why we use it uh, when we're working with bigger groups and things like that. Um, it, it's the safest, um, in my opinion. But I, I think if every athlete should be able to get over it, and it's it's a it's that idea that some of our athletes are wound really tight, and instead of kind of unwinding them, it's easier. I shouldn't say easier; it just makes sense. Um, with facility and program, that's why some coaches stay away from it. Um, but for me, like I had no other choice. It was either that or we don't work the lats. Um, and for me, that wasn't an option um, due to how vital they are in the sport. So we found ways to work it. Um, and and yeah, I've never had an injury from a chip. So now you just brought a VBT there. Do you use it for both uh, to watch the meters per second on a heavy lift to shut them off? And also for speed, or are you just using it for speed? How are you working your velocity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, if we're if we are going heavy and I don't have good numbers on on athletes, or I feel like my numbers might be a little outdated, um, we'll hook up the the, the gym awareness. We we have enough systems that we can run a good sized group um, with the gym awareness, but we don't have one for every rack. So it's not something that we use for every lift or. Um, <laughs> We incorporate with every single lift. If we are doing any kind of speed work, yeah, we have the, the gym wear set up. Um, I like to go by Ryan Mann's recommendations for strength versus accelerated strength versus strength speed and speed strength zones. Um, and and I, I just surf the curve. I mean, I, I there are different times of the year or even uh, different weeks of a cycle uh, where we're doing different parts of that, kind of trying to really work on that, uh, developing that power the best we can. I tend to like to do a strength day um, like a heavy, heavy strength day, um, an upper body focused day, and then a dynamic speed day. Um, and that's kind of how, if I'm doing a three day split, that's how my week is set up, um, on the upper body and the heavy strength is still total body. Um, but maybe the focus is a little bit different. Um, but that, that speed day is absolutely total body. And we're, we're trying to work different, different, uh, parts of the curve and, and we are use different movements, you know, uh, you know, and we're gonna do the same throughout the week. You know, we'll do med ball throws on our upper body focus day where maybe I'm going to superset them with cable, um, work. So the cable is like a heavier rotation. Um, maybe we're throwing some eccentrics in there and then they're going over there and they're trying to do some side shuffle to, to scoop tosses to try to work on more of that acceleration. Um, so that's kind of, We'll use VBT, but it's for the same concept that goes around with the rest of our program. Um, we're trying to always surf the curve, um, putting different emphasis, different parts of the year. I know the the word vertical integration gets thrown around a lot, um, and I would say that's kind of a similar concept um, to what we're trying to do. Um, you could also look at it as like more of an undulating type week, uh, or or um, kind of how that that looks in terms of our program and our volume and, and how we're trying to attack. Baseball, it's kind of, uh, as a metrics, always really put a lot of focus on the 60. Working with athletes trying to get them faster, are you 
trying to help them get their 60 faster? Are you looking closer at a 30 uh, base to base? Where are you trying to improve a baseball player as far as the sprint concept falls into line? Yeah, I, I would say we are trying to make our athletes, um, we're trying to improve both their max velocity and their acceleration speed. Um, I don't like throwing a number out there. We do not test the 60 unless Coach Jackson comes up and says, hey, we need it for a scout. Um, I, I do not like the 60. I don't think it's applicable to um, what we're trying to accomplish with our team. Uh, in a straight line, they're never going to run 60 yards. Uh, but I do think we need to prepare them to be able to run 60 yards or 90 yards um, because a triple is 90 yards. I mean, it, it's when we're when we're thinking about it from that perspective. Uh, inside the park, home run, you know, you might be running 120 yards. So we're trying to increase their max velocity. Um, we're trying to increase their their work capacity, uh, and we're trying to increase their acceleration speed. So with acceleration, we're trying to get more of that coming off the, you know, getting that lead. I'm sorry, getting that first step off off a, a, a steal or coming out of the box or uh, kind of those first, you know, five to 10 yards, you know, trying to be as explosive as possible. Um, and then max velocity, it's being able to maintain their max speed as far as long as we can. Um, and when we do that, we're going to start a little bit more cautious. Um, like I said, I'm a short to long approach type of guy. Uh, we'll do more build up runs um, to kind of build that work capacity. So our build up runs will range anywhere from 20 to 50 yards. Um, and when we're doing that, it's slow to fast, right? So the, the really only top speed for, maybe you know three to four steps uh kind of really trying to start slow build that up and then we go to flying sprints In the flying sprints we start with a 20 yard build up to a 10 yard fly and kind of increase it from there uh, keeping the reps kind of at a minimal um and then i build that into what coach jackson's trying to accomplish um there are going to be times we are doing full out sprints from home to second right or from first to third and in reality it's not a full uh when they're doing that, it's not full 60 yards because they're going to slide into the bag, and, you know, you know, kind of dependent on if they're going first to third, they're starting a couple yards off the bag and vice versa. Um, but we need to be able, they need to be able to stay that fast um, and curve sprinting. That's a big thing that we will put a little bit more emphasis on this year. We put emphasis on in the past, um, but we're going to make sure that we put a little bit more emphasis on this year's our curve sprinting because I think that probably applies to more what happens in the outfield, um, and then what happens with base running. Uh, the short linear accelerations just don't happen as much in baseball uh, because even when they have to uh, run from first to first to second, you're talking about being able to change uh, their move their hips and, and take the take the drop step and everything that's needed. Uh, and most of the time, it, unless they're straight stealing the base, they're still going to round the bag to see if they can get an extra ball, right? So being able to add that little bit of a, a curve and how you lean into it and all that is going to be pretty important. Uh, I think from an injury reduction standpoint, um, but also from a performance standpoint. At the level you're at, steel in the base is incredibly tough. The catchers are elite. Your base runners have to be elite. So every hundredth of a second is going to matter. Will you adjust the starts of base runners to help them figure out that acceleration phase? Because baseball, you know, that's one of the few sports you start laterally and then move into the sprint and understanding how to get their body turned and moving through that has to be a complicated process for some of the guys. Some uh, others, I'm sure, are just natural. How do you kind of uh, help break that down to create a faster base runner? Yeah, first first we work with the coaching staff, right? So we we – get a good feel for what kind of drills they're going to do in practice to kind of work on that. Um, and then, and working down with, with an athlete, you, you just got to watch them, right? You got to see where you can make little tweaks and then you got to assess risk versus reward, right? I think, um, the biggest thing we have to remember is these athletes make it to this level for a reason. So, um, if you got somebody who is already stealing a ton of bags, um, uh, and, and one of the top in the conference, messing too much with what they're doing might be detrimental. Like just to squeeze out maybe two or three more, right? You know, um, if it's somebody who gets a terrible jump every time, we're going to dissect it and, and try to work on why are they going to tell? Is, is it because they're crossing over instead of drop stepping? 
Um, let's try to add a drop slip. To it. Uh, but if naturally they're stealing a ton of bases and it's not a injury risk type of form, I don't mess with it too much because I think part of it is realizing your athletes are, especially where we're at, they made it to the highest level of baseball for a reason, right? And if it's somebody that already is really good at what they do, uh, we're going to fill the bucket where it needs to be filled otherwise. Uh, because usually if they're really good at base stealing, there's some other aspect that we can work on from a physical physical standpoint to make it better. Are they maybe not as good at, you know, legging out a double because their max velocity, or their ability to maintain their maximal speed just isn't there. So maybe I put a little bit more focus on that. Um, so we don't do it with everybody, but when we just when just working with the coaching staff, what the coaches are seeing, what I'm seeing, if we determine it's something we, we want to mess with, we're going to. And if we're going to mess with it, we're doing it in the offseason. I'm a firm believer by the time you play weekend one, you're going to do, from my standpoint, we're going to keep doing what we're doing to keep them strong and maybe get them a little bit stronger. Um, but we're not going to do a ton of messing around with people who are going to be playing on a daily basis. Uh, because at that point, it's more about how we maximize what they're doing on the field uh, than making a ton of changes from a physicality standpoint. Uh, just because when we are already have to deal with all the stressors of being on the road, playing four to five days a week, um, it gets dangerous. But even just simple, something simple, um, I worked with an athlete in the past uh, that 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 changed kind of their their diet their diet um, and that just gets dangerous, right? Where uh, the performance just wasn't the same. Uh, even caffeine levels, if you mess with those, uh, kind of trying to work on developing all that stuff in the off season, so that routine, but also their body isn't trying to make huge ad- adjustments when it has a ton of extra stressors on top. Working with the overhead athlete, we've talked about that quite a bit and going back and watching some of your stuff. In season, will you move away from a barbell squat and move into a belt squat, goblet squat, something to relieve that bar on the back? Yeah, so um, full transparency, I never actually back squat my my baseball guys. Um, That is not so much, I won't lie, I always start with front squat with all my athletes um and until we get to a point um of certain relative strength i don't move to a back squat, um because i like that upright upright posture position um uh, not saying like you have to do it that way it's just part of my philosophy um and, and how i go about training um so baseball tends to stay um if we have guys with el- AP elbows or shoulders we'll go safety bar um or we'll go front squat and that's it uh, you know, when I was at Memphis, I would say our hitters were front squat year round, unless I had a guy with a, with a achy elbow or sore shoulder or something like that, where uh, just getting into a front squat position just didn't feel comfortable, or the bar didn't feel comfortable there, because um, the safety bar adds a little extra padding. Um, but none of our athlete, none sorry, none of our baseball guys actually back squat it, um, and it's just kind of how I built my baseball training philosophy. Um, I like the working the thoracic extension that a front squat brings. Um, so I prefer that um, over over a safety bar. Um, I won't lie. I mean, I think kind of going with what you were saying, if a back squat was not comfortable, I would move to a safety bar. Um, and I think that's a that's a great alternative that if your facility has it, it's great. Um, or, you know, if a front squat works as well, go that route. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, I worked with a, a student athlete once that every time they front or sorry, every time they back squat or safety bar squat it, um, they have very limited thoracic extension and very limited um, upper body mobility to begin with. Um, and so they're kind of between their lower lumbar and the middle of their thoracic. It was very, very arched when they would go and squat because they were trying to get that big chest and get into the back squat position. So at the top of the squat, they felt like they had to wear a belt Otherwise, they would have an achy back all the time. Um, so what we did was work on movement and mobility. They felt it was just easier to get into a front squat position and keep that upright posture without having to kind of compensate from that area uh, or go into a safety bar squat for that meantime um, while we kind of worked on that range of motion. And then hopefully they get they get safe enough to that they can back squat as well. So I think it's kind of looking at that. Um, is it a... a mobility issue um or that with an athlete if you're going different times of the year um because i don't think back squatting is a bad thing 
I've just programmed that I mostly front squat. Uh, and then I program to make sure we're hitting the posterior chain and other ways. Going into that front squat, I mean, you run into a lot of different type of athletes with different body builds and, and how they look. Developing that carriage where they feel comfortable front squatting a massive amount of weight. What do you put into that to kind of help them all get there? Some are going to hit, obviously hit it easier than others, but some are just going to be so bound up and so tight that they don't feel like they can get their hands in that position. Absolutely. So um, I'm not, I'm not against people doing the crossed arm front squat. I think that kind of gets a bad rep. Uh, I won't lie. I don't think you can push as much weight. Cause I don't think you're going to be as stable as if you can get into a front rack position. Um, but what I do is I kind of try to tra- take the slow methodical approach. When you're, when you got somebody who's a little bound up, it's going to, it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, and they're going to have to buy into the movement system. And I think that's, I'll be honest with you with that type of athlete. Um, you have to be that type of athlete to work within my movement system. Um, and I have those honest conversations and, and we, um, put that into the recruiting pitch and all that. And I make the adjustments as needed because obviously uh, if they're one of my athletes, we're going to make sure they succeed. Um, but it's going to, for some people, it's just a longer process. Uh, and so what I what I do is work on two or three correctives slash um, stretches that they can do, whether it's like a rotational lat stretch or uh, they're doing a, a wrist stretch. Uh, if they're, if it, the wrist is, the wrist is the mobility issue. Uh, we might go just a couple fingers on there. We'll use straps as well for, I found that's kind of worked well, kind of working around different mobility issues, those types of things, but we're going to work on trying to develop that without sacrificing. Them. So if we're going to do a front squat and we got to cross arm for, for a month or two, um, while we build the range of motion, that's great. Uh, but how are you building that? So they eventually accomplish because that's the, that's the key is, um, with a pitcher, I won't lie. I, I really don't care which way they go. If they feel more comfortable the other way, uh, cause we'll do a lot of front rack work, but we'll also do reverse lunges and we're going to progress a little bit different, um, than how we do with our hitters. Um, uh, but when we do it, the biggest thing I look at is where do I want to get and how am I going to get it? and making sure we're for me, the front squat is just a big part of our programming. So how do I get them to front squat? Um, uh, I can say I've never had an athlete. I've never got into front squat comfortably, or I've never not gotten the front squat comfortably. Just some have taken longer than others. And maybe some of them stay with straps for a whole year. And that's what we got to do. So the next summer we can really hone into it. Then let's, let's do it. Um, because sometimes it does take the day. I have a little bit more one-on-one time. Um, you know, you try to get them to, to hang around during the summer, uh, on a voluntary basis and work with you. Great. If not, you know, you're going to just work around it the best you can. Um, but I think different body types play a factor. Uh, but when it comes to a front squat position, I would say usually it's more of a mobility issue than a body type. Where they have their hands might be a little bit more of a body type, but normally it's a mobility issue that we end up having to address in through our uh, program and then. Now we can move into some other questions. We talked training quite a bit. We've kind of been all over the map, but a division one schedule, traveling with the team, everything that goes into that, how do you balance the family life so that you're getting just as much put in at home as you are at work? Yeah, that's the tough part. Uh, so for me, I, I'll start by saying I have one most understanding in, uh, people in my life and my wife. Um, she's awesome. She's went through this journey with me. I started in the private sector and decided to go into college athletics. Um, she was with me when I was a college athlete. So um, she's seen every side of my career choices and basically my whole entire adult life has been with her. Um, so we're, we've been on this journey together. So she understands. Um, and I'm lucky because really from January to June, she holds down the fort. She takes care of our, our, our two children and she's a superstar. Um, I don't know how she does it. Uh, I'm lucky to have her, but I think it's having that support system. Um, and that reminder too, like I have people around me that constantly remind me that and it's people I work with and 
uh, family and things like that, that, that my wife and kids are the most important thing in the world and everything I do is for them anyway. Uh, I won't lie. If I, I'm lucky to be at Mizzou and I mean, it's a great opportunity for me, but if I never made it up to this level and, and got to work at this level, um, but somebody said, Hey, you're a great father and a great husband. That would be good enough. Um, and I think that's what I kind of take from it is yes, my job is to, um, uh, be the best athletic performance coach I can and that, to help our athletes succeed. Um, but college athletics also gives me a chance to build my family. Um, you know, leaving Memphis was tough with all the athletes I worked with there. Um, and, and what I said to a lot of them was my family got bigger. I, you know, I, I really, my, my girls gained a lot of brothers and sisters um, when I worked at the University of Memphis. They loved going there. Uh, they loved, you know, helping hand out food after baseball games and they loved going to soccer games and cheering on the guys. Um, in reality, they they will probably do the same thing here at Mizzou. Um, and so trying to integrate my family the most I can, I think college athletics allows that. Um, Mizzou has been awesome. You know, one of the first things that uh, my boss, uh, Rourke Cutchlow, told me was, hey, your family can be around here as much as they want. And then, like, that's important to me uh, because it allows them to maybe spend some time on late, late days with me. Uh, either in the weight room or um, over at the baseball facility or out on the track or watching a track meet or, um, you know, helping with, helping with our cheerleaders. Um, and it, it's one of those that the more they can be around it, hopefully helps to motivate them to potentially get to that level someday, but also um, helps them to build a support system. Um, because the biggest thing is we are pretty far away from home. I'm an East coast kid, uh, born in, born outside of Philly, grew up outside DC. All my family's back East. Um, all my wife's family, um, except for some cousins and one brother, is mostly back east as well. So my, you know, we we really are just four of us here in Columbia. Um, so the more we can build a support system around that, um, the better. Now I knew you grew up back east, me and you had talked about it before, but I didn't know you were in Wichita. So how was it from being born and raised back east to ending up in Wichita, Kansas? What kind of culture shock was that? It was it was a shock. It was a shock, but I'll be honest with you. I would say it was one of the best experiences we've had um, as a family. I think uh, that Midwest culture, and I've seen a lot of it here in Columbia as well. Is it's it's different. Um, I am a city kid. Like I I love the hustle and bustle of a city. Like when I worked at George Washington University, I won't lie. If I was stressed out, I would go walk around you know the block just like to CVS or something like that. But just the cars racing by the constant having to be um, stimulated by the, your surroundings. You couldn't be on your phone because you would get hit. Um, like that's the, that's what I love. Like and it, being within a walking distance and just kind of the craziness that ensues. It's not the most fun to commute in. Um, but like, I, I love it. Uh, my wife is the opposite. Uh, we grew up in the same part of Northern Virginia and she likes the suburbs. She likes kind of a little bit quieter of a lifestyle. Uh, you know, more of that homey feel neighborhood. Um, kind of building, you know, friends, you know, a tight, close knit, knit of friends. Um, and I think, you know, Wichita brought that. Um, it's one of those, I'll be honest with you, if I would have been an 18 to 22 year old kid and went to school in Wichita, probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. Uh, but being a young parent and, and having young children, um, we got friends that still stay in contact. With, and I would consider them some of our, our closest friends. Uh, I got to see them when we went back to Wichita State last year, which was awesome. It was really cool. Um, just being back in Wichita and, and, and kind of feeling. Uh, you know, I, I feel we'll get similar weather here. I don't necessarily miss the crazy storms and, and, and some of the tornadoes and, and, and all that. But, you know, it's it's one of those situations that I don't regret our time there. Uh, I grew a lot as a professional, but I also grew a lot as a, as a parent. Um, and me and my wife grew very close um, just kind of being out on our own and all that. It was a huge risk. We had never left the East Coast and we picked up and moved 17 hours away. And we really truly were on our own. Um, and I think it set us up to be able to put our family in a position where we were able to take this job, right? I think, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with staying where you're from and where you're born. But um, in the college profession, I can't be picky. Uh, in Northern Virginia, there's some great schools. You know, I, I went to got my master's degree from, you know, George Washington, right in right inside DC. Uh, but you know, an opportunity like the SEC does not exist. Uh, you know, there is ACC schools and some great opportunities there and big 10 schools. 
pretty close by, but uh, to be SC baseball, I, I would have had to leave. So I think we felt more comfortable living on our own and being far away from family based on that experience. So I definitely, it was a culture shock for sure. Uh, but I think it was a great experience for us and set us up. I know Wichita. I don't know much about Philly. Uh, the The closest I've ever been to Philly was R- Rocky was on last night. We watched that. So <laughs> that, that's the closest thing I've ever seen to it. Uh, I haven't traveled much back east. So are you starting to, I don't know, mellow and uh, just kind of fall into that Midwest culture pretty easy or is, is it difficult? Um, I think it's the lifestyle I want um, for my wife and kids. Uh, me and my wife talked about, you know, we're, we had our first kid when we were pretty young. Um, so we're going to be still fairly young when we send our last off to college. Uh, at that point, I would like to go to a bigger city, um, potentially back east. Um, I like the Midwest culture. I, I, I think it's good. Um, at times, and I think college athletics is what really kind of feeds that for me is, I, I, I need the chaos. I need the hustle and bustle. I need the, the fast paced lifestyle and that's college athletics. So it, it works well for me because no matter whether you're in the Midwest or you're in mid South or you're out East college athletics are, is fast paced and never changing. I mean, just look in the past two weeks, um, who would have thought we would have had two, two conferences stretching coast to coast, um, you know, two power five conferences stretching coast to coast. And now at the big 10 and the big 12, we do. So, uh, it's it's an ever changing landscape, which kind of keeps me on my toes and fills that need. Um, but you know, me and my wife went for a nice walk around uh, Columbia today. You know, there's a million trails in Columbia. I think that's probably the one thing that nobody told told you unless you knew somebody from Columbia. Um, there's a new trail every single day. Kind of that peaceful in the wilderness type walk is is, is huge. Um, kind of let my mind reset, but also you know just strolling. You know the stresses of of being a parent and, and working full time, um, kind of go away. You get to just spend time with with one another and and all that. And I think that kind of that slow paced mid Midwest culture is important in that realm because I don't think you get as much of that the more you live in the city and um, some of those bigger East Coast cities. Uh, you know, I've been to uh, obviously Philly a lot. You know, I was there till I was seven, but I have a lot of family there as well. Um, basically, grew up in DC. Uh, and then New York City is a different beast. I've only been there once, and I'm not sure I want to go back. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, but when they talk about a lot of people, there are a lot of people. Um, and so I think I am starting to get a little bit more used to this lifestyle. I will tell you, I'm a lot more used to these prices. Uh, I can definitely afford a house out here. Uh, you know, it's a little bit different when you're talking about, you know, the norm is, you know, 500 plus thousand dollars for a house um you get closer to some of those bigger cities um so i I definitely like these uh midwest prices we uh did this earlier in the week and the audio didn't work out and so we kind of talked about this and i thought you had some pretty good insight onto it so i'll kind of wrap up with this not to ruin your whole afternoon uh by being on here but as you've worked in college athletics you've got to see the athletes move more into a business side of it you know of course they enjoy the sports they play but at some point it all changes and they're getting told where to be what workouts to be what practice to be they they give their life up for the sport so what advice would you have for i mean yourself your young parent or other parents that are fighting the competitive battle fighting the high school sport battle that are just so wrapped up in it you know just learning to enjoy it while it's at this level because the next level gets crazy. Absolutely. Um, so you're, you're asking specifically from a parent's perspective, correct? It could be a parent. It could even be a coach. I mean, uh, you know, right. anybody that isn't used to the level that you see it at and how much yep. it changes. Absolutely. Um, I think it's first realizing uh, youth coach, parent, um, most of these kids won't go um, and, and I think it's like 1%, um, even go division one, um, college. Right. And, um, most of them are using sports to build qualities that we, we had when we grew up. Right. I'll be honest, my hard work ethic, um, came from my father and came from sports, right. My ability to work as a team, I'm more of an introverted person, uh, 
but my ability to lead and work as a team came from sports. Um, it, and it, it's, it's being challenged in those realms. Um, and not, and not, and just realizing that, man, kids are only nine months. You know, I got a nine year old, uh, and, and last year was our first experience. She just a travel softball team and she loved it. She built a you know, great relationship with our coaches and, and great relationship with um, her teammates. And she loved going to tournaments. Right. Um, but just how those terms were structured as a, as a parent, as a coach, I looked at it and I was like, man, we don't even make our college athletes go through this. Um, because like she would have her first game at eight and the championship game would be, I think the first tournament, the championship game was played at 2 a.m. And the first game was at 8 a.m. Um, 2 a.m. the next day. So like you're talking about keeping these kids there for almost 24 hours. Um, and why, right? It's, it's one of those, are they going to get that much better at that point? Um, uh, I don't know, but I know for me, I go to the games just to enjoy the moment, right? My kid's only going to be nine once. Um, and I really just want to watch her enjoy it, just have fun. Uh, you know, there was one game during that travel softball season. She came up the bat, and they were down three and, uh, she hit a ball all the way to the fence and she missed home plate a chance to tie the game. She was tagged out. You know, it's one of those that I was very happy for how everybody reacted on our team. And that's how I knew she was on the right team. Um, because a lot of parents, would have lost, right. A lot of parents would have been upset and mad, but like I'm talking about a nine year old kid. And it's just a funny story. You know, we, we still kind of make the joke sometimes when, when she scores a run, Oh, you didn't miss home that time. Like it's fun. It, and that's what sports are supposed to be. Um, I think when we, if they are turning more into a business and I don't blame, them. you know, it's, we all have to make a living. And if that's your, if that's your profession and that's how you make money, you're going to find the way to make the most money. Um, but the idea that we have to develop a, a, a college level athlete and specialize at such a young age, um, from a, from a athletic performance standpoint, I actually don't like, um, I would prefer you to play multiple sports all throughout high school and, and, and coming into college, if you have to specialize, I went to a much bigger school, so I wasn't going to make three, three teams. So I try to make sure I made one so I can keep playing the sport. Then I understand that, but, uh, to specialize at such a young age, I think movements get very robotic, um, uh, cause we really only do the same movements, uh, being able to do it, do, do a different movements, just make sure a better athlete makes you more flexible. Um, if you play, multiple sports, it might be easier to convert you from an infielder to an outfielder. And in, in college, that might be the way you make it onto an SEC roster, right? You know, we, we, we had some guys last year um, that I think really stepped up to new roles. Um, and that was the difference probably between them starting and, and being, you know, a, a huge force within the conference and then riding the bench if they weren't able to make the adjustment. Uh, and also won us some games, right? And I think, that's what parents need to realize. I don't coach my kid for one reason. Um, I'm very, very tough and very, very critical when it comes to sports because that's who, how I was on myself. Um, and I would rather my kid get coached by somebody that maybe can relate to her because that's not her personality. Um, if she was my personality, then maybe I would be the right coach for her, but I realize I'm not. Um, so I let the coach coach. Uh, there are definitely times I don't agree with it, uh, but I try to remember like as long as my kid's having fun and my kid's enjoying it, then it's the right decision because, and in part of that goes back to what I said, like my wife is the perfect compliment. My wife stopped playing sports when she was a sophomore in high school. Um, she played sports when she was growing up. Sports just were never the, the thing that drove them. I was not going to go to college unless I was playing a sport in college. You know, it was one of those things that sports was everything. for me. Uh, and so kind of stepping back, realizing that, your kid doesn't have to be a superstar day one. Uh, a lot of people point to the the Michael Jordan story, the even Vegas high school varsity team. And they use it more of a, as a perseverance story. And I'll use it as an example of some people just get really good at a later age and it's okay. Uh, you know, as long as they're enjoying it, it's what they want to do. Let them put as much effort into it as they want, but don't force it upon them. Um, and I think, you're right. Everything's turned into more of a business now. Uh, and it's one of those situations that I think it's up to us as parents to put our kids in the situation that's best for them. I won't lie. I thrived in, in travel ball, like playing eight games a day. I loved it. And I think it's allowed me to be able to work 10, 12 hour days and not think twice about it. Uh, 
but that's not for everybody. Uh, I think it's making sure you set your kid up and you're letting them kind of build the, the qualities that are going to allow them to be successful in the future, whether that's in college athletics, professional athletics, or in a field that's got nothing to do with athletics. Um, and I try to take that approach with my children. Um, I'm excited. Both my kids get to play uh, softball here in, in Columbia this fall. And I'm, I'm excited to be able to catch some games and just kick back and relax because it's a, it's a break. I get, I coach all day, so I don't want to coach at night. Um, so it allows me just to be a parent and be a dad and, um, helps me to grow as a person as well. Well, coach, I appreciate you taking time to do this not only once, but twice. Uh, I know how crazy your, your schedule is. I think the university of Missouri is lucky to have you and, uh, I'm glad you made it over. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to get, a, get to know Missouri as a state a little bit more and be part of such a great institution, but also be close to the people like you and, and be able to pick some, um, pick your brain and grow as a professional. Well, thank you very much, coach. Uh, hopefully I'll get over there this fall for some stuff and uh, maybe we can meet up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Well, have a great afternoon. You too. <laughs>